Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to this presentation. Um, I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes to um, let Sarah get things set up um, recording and putting us on Facebook Live. Um, a couple more people are coming in from the waiting room. Um, so we'll just give it another uh, minute or so for us to make sure everything is all set up and we will get started. Um, for anybody new coming in, if you guys could uh, mute yourselves and then also turn off your video, that'll just help with the um, streaming. Um, and that will also just help with kind of reducing any distractions. So it should be at the um, bottom left corner of your screen. It says mute and stop video. And that is where you can mute yourself and turn off your video. Um, and we will get started. So. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'm here with my coworker, Sarah. We are the staff members at Detroit Audubon and Andrea from the Bird Center of Washtenaw County is here with us. Um, and as you know, she will be telling us all about um, her work as the um, manager of the Bird Center of Washtenaw County. And um, we're very excited. It'll be about a 45 minute presentation is our goal, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. So any questions that you are interested in, just put them in the chat box. I'll be recording them, and then I will read them off to Andrea at the end. Okay, and with that, I'll pass it over to you, Andrea. All right, hi everybody. I hope you're doing good today on this Friday, and we're gonna get started here. I have a little PowerPoint presentation. I wanna go over um, a few things with you all on, on birds, um, what we're seeing kind of in the center right now and a little bit about wildlife rehab. So um, if you do not know what the Bird Center is or where the Bird Center is, uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit public charity and our mission is to rehabilitate and release injured and orphaned songbirds. We do take in Duck lanes at the beginning of the season um, when we have the space and availability. And we have two sub permittee um, people that work with us that take in duck lanes for us. Uh, we also do some other birds such as small marsh birds or um, sh small shore birds, but we usually do that just to triage and then we'll usually transfer over to the Howell Nature Center. We've been an organization since 2004 founded by Carol Akerloff and we have been um, in our little facility on Mary Street, um, which is in a residential neighborhood since 2004. We are looking for another building. We've always been looking for another building, but um, it is in more need than ever right now because of the amount of birds that we are taking in every year for the past few years is growing. We're getting in about 100 to 200 birds more each season. And our facility is basically um, outgrown itself. We need to expand. Uh, we need to have flight cages directly on our property instead of at different locations. And um, we just, you know, need to need to get a bigger place to help more birds. So um, that's a goal. We'll see when we can make that happen. The first topic I wanted to talk about with you guys today is window pane. So we see a lot of issues that you know, occur at the bird center. So window and car collisions are probably our number one mixed with cats. I don't have the statistics for this year um, to know what the numbers are, um, but right now it's feeling about equal. And I think that's because the people are home more from this pandemic. Um, we are working on a skeleton crew. Basically, we lost about uh, five interns that were gonna be working this season, so we're down. So it might seem like we're having more birds coming in because we have less staff, but I think we actually are, um, we're seeing about double the intake right now in collision cases because people are at home, they're seeing or hearing birds hit their windows, um, and then they're seeing more incidences. Um, we thought at the beginning of the season that we were gonna have less issues with trees, um, but people started doing more yard work. 
And so we're seeing nest destruction and birds coming in, you know, um, that's definitely something that we always recommend to hold off for during nesting season. Um, tree trimming can wait. And um, it's something that, you know, we see a lot of because there's a lot of birds that live in trees that are in the cavity of the tree that people are unaware of. Uh, we see a lot of fledglings, which um, we put in quotes kidnapped. We say that because a lot of the time these birds are out in their yard. They're meant to be in their yard. And, um, you know, people just assume that there's something wrong with it. And just because it can't fly, um, it's going to be trying to learn how to do that in the next few days. So we want to keep that bird out there. We want to be responsible by keeping your dogs and stuff away from that area. And, um, you know, let that bird live out the next few days as it's learning how to, you know, fledge and, and start flying. So we see those birds a lot that are taken in because of circumstances. So we want to make sure that those birds are sane. Um, and we also want to make sure it's important to not be feeding them even though um, Google tells you all sorts of things on what to feed, the majority of those are all incorrect. And when people feed improper diets, especially long-term, if they keep a bird for a while, it can cause a lot of um, permanent issues. So um, we have just a couple other things, pesticides, sticky traps, um, initial harm. We've seen a lot of initial harm this year, not just with our center, but from other centers. Um, we think that a lot of people are unfortunately more pent up than they have been before, you know? Um, and people are also unfortunately bored and looking for something to do. And so we've seen um, a lot of abuse situations with animals, um, unnecessary abuse. So that's something that um, we need to be more aware of and educate on how that's not okay. Birds, why are they important? That's a huge question that we get all the time. And we also get, oh, it's just a bird. You know, oh, it's just a bird. And birds are so important to us. They pollinate, they are pest controls, they're eating all of our bugs. Our aerial insectivores are eating everything for us, which is wonderful. Um, they help with science, technology, database, um, mapping, different things like that. They also provide enrichment for us, something to give us joy and, and something to do. So there are plenty of ways that um, birds are beneficial to us in general and also to our environment. And birds are at risk all over the place. If you see all these lights on, this is one of the issues on window strikes. And it's not just coming from our house and home where birds are hitting, but they're hitting in buildings around the world. So a lot of people have seen the 3 billion birds um, information over the past year. It has brought a lot of awareness to uh, the bird issues on why we're losing so many birds how many bird numbers are down and how they're affecting um, our ecosystems. So um, the, some of the things that we're gonna touch base on today are in this on, step, on the seven simple actions on how to help birds. Um, but we're, um, the big things are obviously protecting your windows, keeping your cats inside, don't use pesticides and um, plant native. That's a huge one. Leave your, leave your yards alone, plant native. Um, aerial insectivore numbers um, are one of the big things that the bird center sees. We do specialize in swallows and swifts. They are a very hard species um, to take care of. They can eat anywhere from every 10 to 20 minutes and uh, they fly when they eat. So as babies, they don't know how to do that and they need assistance. And the numbers for, bar for barn swallows is incredibly low. And a lot of our um, swallow species and other aerial insectivores are going down, um, mostly because of the pesticide problem, because a lot of these, uh, their food is being sprayed and it's causing them to die. So that's a huge thing that we want to make sure we are, you know, preventing. So let's talk window strikes. So collision strikes are one of the most common things that we see at the bird center. And it's preventable. Um, we can help. Now, when it comes to buildings and different architecture, it's a little bit more difficult. We do have a lot of help from different organizations in the area. Um, this year, it is a little bit more difficult. We are not allowed to go out and be collecting birds because um, plastic bags that they might stay in might have the virus um, still on there or something they don't specifically know. And also the universities are not at work right now. So we don't have anybody in the buildings doing the bird data for us. So it's very unfortunate that a lot of these birds that are dying around 
uh, buildings um, are not being able to be preserved and saved. So um, we are saying if you do find a bird, you can bring it to us um, or you can um, dispose of it properly. But the big ticker and note that everybody needs to know, simple fact, birds cannot see glass. So they see the reflection in, and it's transparent to them. So the migratory birds are really impacted a lot because they are flying all across at full speed. Um, they're tired sometimes, they can be underweight um, and, and they're more susceptible because they're coming in and not seeing this. And even when they go through the same path that they've gone through before, a new building that might be put up is going to interrupt that flight pattern. So we need to really be protecting. We need to be uh, promoting lights out um, in the cities during the migration and really in any time to help our environment in general. But Lights Out is a wonderful program where you can actually turn the lights out at nighttime to save energy and to protect the birds from being um, hitting the windows at nighttime when they're migrating. So these are some examples of bird injuries. And I know the skull can kind of be a little alarming, but that is what can happen to a skull on a bird when it hits a window. We will often see a broken coracoid, which is their collarbone area. And in the picture lower on the right, that is where that issue was for this bird, which is a purple martin. And they need to have their flight 100%. All birds obviously need to have 100%, but aerial insectivore migratory birds need to be even above 100% if possible because they are flying nonstop to catch their food. Swifts will sleep in flight and I don't even know how that's possible, but they do. Um, so they need to be 100%. And if that shoulder area where they're flying is damaged, it's, it's not a good outcome for them. They get swollen um, humerus and, and inflammation in their wings and muscles and joints. They can get brain inflammation and brain swelling, neurological issues, sometimes causing seizures, temporary paralysis where they can't feel their legs and have spinal inflammation, air sac ruptures, which is a picture up in the right-hand corner. Um, you'll actually see bubbles underneath the skin, which can cause subcutaneous emphysema. And we have to treat that with strong antibiotics. So when birds, especially large woodpeckers, hit their um, chest when they're flying and they hit the window with their chest, it can cause a lot of ruptures and issues. Also leading up to internal bleeding, possible seizures and death. So these are things that people might be unaware of that occur when a bird hits the window. Um, most of the time people just think, oh, it's kind of stunned and you know, it'll recuperate and fly off. And maybe sometimes that is the case. However, these issues can sometimes come up like 24 hours later. And so we would like all these birds to come into rehab, regardless of the thought of baby saying, oh, it might, it might be okay. It's just a little stunned, it'll shake it off. So we want it to treat it properly and take care of it. Um, I kind of say, what happens if you were running full force and slammed completely into the wall? You wouldn't be okay in just a little bit to shake it off. Um, you would need some treatment and some help. So when a bird comes to the bird center, we provide oxygen therapy for it. Um, that has been one of the most um, helpful things that we have used at the bird center. Um, so when you go to the hospital, if you were injured, they would provide you with fluid therapy, um, oxygen, and pain meds. And that's the same thing that we do for our birds. We can also provide them with proper diet and um, enclosures, which is something unfortunately can't happen a lot at people's homes because of kids around other animals and just not knowing what you know a bird requires and what they need. Birds, um, birds are one of the harder birds to rehab out of any wildlife. Um, some birds are very tiny, sensitive. Um, if you do something wrong to it, it could stress out very easy and it could pass away. So songbirds are one of the most fragile birds and this is why unfortunately we do not have a lot of songbird rehabbers is because they are such a fragile, fragile species that people don't wanna work with them. Um, so uh, we are here for a reason and we want to help take care of these birds. Um, and so a lot of issues can occur because of a window collision. And so 50% of birds that strike glass die on sight um, the survivors we often see are, are coming into us, especially this season, we're seeing a lot of collision cases that are then cat attacked. 
So we'll see a bird and we know this because we'll see a bird come in. It might have some swelling in the head or just, you know, looking a little off and we can tell that um, because of um, the, the knowledge and the, and the work that we've done over the years, we know how to tell a collision injury. But then you can also see wounds on a bird after um, that are not specifically from a collision um, where you can actually see puncture wounds or feather loss and we can know that that bird was possibly attacked by a cat or a dog because it's in the most susceptible part um, of its life when it's injured. And so birds can hit, they get attacked, they're brought to us, and then we try to treat them for both injuries at the same time. Hummingbirds are one of the, the worst cases, I have to admit. There's usually no good outcome for them. They weigh only about three to three and a half grams. And when they hit, their wings um, are usually injured the most. They often um, can get calcified breaks, which means their bones are going to heal up quickly and faster more than any other bird because of the high metabolism that they have. And so if you found an injured hummingbird, it's important to bring it in right, right away so we can start it on uh, meds for inflammation and then we can possibly treat the, um, treat the wing break because if it happens and we don't get that bird for anywhere from 12 to 24 hours later, that wing might already be in a healed fracture and not be able to be treated. So this is a perfect example of a junco that hit a window. Um, even though there are some divisions there, they're not close enough. So that bird was not being able to see and it just went right through. These are an example of birds that have hit glass that basically you just probably won't see. Um, so many people are just immune to walking and not looking on the ground, but they're all around us if you just are opening your eyes a little bit more and seeing this was found from safe passage. Um, so be conscious when you are walking, especially around city buildings. And it's important to know if you have found a deceased bird near a window collision. Um, they're just unfortunately around us more than you would think. And um, it happens everywhere at all over stadiums, giant buildings, and even here in Michigan. So this happened in downtown Mount Clemens where a peregrine falcon, which are federally protected um, and a threatened species, um, it, uh, it had died because it flew into the glass parking garage. We also have an issue with our stadium downtown with the neon bright blue lights, which causes issue for our environment, for pollution. They're on at night. Um, there are some, I think, changes recently where the lights um, are not on as much. Um, I don't know all the facts on that, um, but it was a really big concern for quite some time. Same with the, um, the Trade Center for 9-11. Um, you know, it's a beautiful memorial place, but the lights are on at night when birds are migrating and they're flying through and getting trapped. This is in downtown Ypsilanti. This is a perfect example of how birds can see not see the, the, the reflection there. So if you go outside and you look at your windows at your house, if you're seeing trees and landscape behind you, just know that that's what birds are seeing too. And this is a perfect example of that. So this building killed these birds. These are all migratory birds. The majority of them are warblers, which are very, very tiny birds. Um, so unfortunately they don't have an easy chance right away. Um, but we have to start protecting our buildings better. We have to start talking to architects and preventing this death in birds because it's a very fixable, easy one to fix. So more examples here of birds seeing um, the, the reflection of trees in the glass. So silhouettes, this is an example of how you can do silhouettes. So back in the day, silhouettes would be perfect to use and people would post them randomly on their windows and stuff. So we're trying to explain to people that those work, but you have to have them everywhere across your window. So window decals should be basically set up every two inches from each other. And that way the birds are not going to be able to see that, that reflection in, in behind them. So we use different products and suggest products like Kaleidoscape here. You can see the dots are spaced out every two, uh, two to three inches. Uh, and so that breaks up the reflection. Also Feather Friendly has very similar ones. Um, they have lots of different um, patterns, whether it's dots, vertical lines, different, um, you know, bird savers that are placed throughout. Um, you can also do DIY solutions by 
you know, hanging different materials, doing um, at-home painting. So we've seen a lot of cool people right now doing painting jobs. Um, really, really neat ideas. I am a terrible artist, so this would not work for me, but you can do stuff like this. You can use different kinds of soaps and different kinds of um, chalk and paint. So um, you wanna avoid all the UV products. Those ones don't seem to work. And when you are putting these products though on your windows, whether you're drawing or putting anything on there, they must be on the outside surface. They will not work inside. So one of the ideas that Safe Passage recommends for us is to start prevent, help, help the birds around your house. house. So you wanna prevent monthly disease um, with your feeders. Make sure you're washing your feeders. And if you are putting your feeders out and feeding these birds often, make sure you stick with that. Don't just feed them randomly because they depend on you. You want to actually put some of your window feeders closer to your windows because that's going to make a bird stop that momentum when it's getting to the window and stop and get to that feeder. So it helps. It actually prevents some window strikes by having bird feeders closer to your windows. Obviously also for hummingbirds, we know to not use any kind of red dyes or artificial products and make sure you're cleaning those um, every couple days, especially in the heat. So those are the ways that you can help the birds around at your house. Um, the other way, our next topic, let's talk cats. So the guy in the corner, that's one of mine, that's Lewis. <laughs> I have four cats and we're going to touch on this topic very lightly. Um, the first fact that I'm noting here, 95%, maybe even more of the bird center uh, staff absolutely loves cats. We all are cat lovers. We all have them. A lot of people think because we promote keeping your cats inside and, you know, you know, prevent, pre present different information that we're anti-cat and that's not the thing at all. Um, there's, there's so many reasons on why cats are better inside. So we just want to get that out that we are cat lovers at the bird center. <laughs> um, so what happens though when your cat can go out unattended and he's free to roam? So let's not even touch on the main topic here. So I was a veterinary technician before I became a rehabber. I'm still basically a technician, but I'm just not practicing. Um, and one of the main things that I saw was the majority of injuries on cats coming in were because they were from outside. And as a cat owner with four cats, I, it breaks my heart because I love them. I can't leave my house unless I know that they are there and they're okay and they're safe. And so they could be locked in a closet and I would be freaked out for the rest of the day. Um, so we wanna make sure our cats are safe, right? So by letting them outside, they are subject to getting hit by a car. They can be shot with BB guns or arrows. I've actually had to pull an arrow out of a cat's skull. This is not a picture of that cat, but um, it happens. Um, they can ingest toxins, pesticides, and poisons um, unintentionally or unintentionally by humans. So um, a lot of people, dislike outside cats or they think they're a nuisance. They don't understand some of them belong to owners and they will intentionally poison them at times. They can get viruses, um, infections, different parasites, zoonotic diseases that can be passed through their feces um, and into our water systems, which is a concern. They, spread, they can spread viruses to other cats, causing other cats to become sick. They obviously, we know this, kill our native wildlife, which is at a huge decline. Um, young animals are most susceptible, including fledglings uh, for birds and then any kind of baby mammals. Cats can also be stolen and be taken. I personally own a Bengal cat, um, which is a purebred wild cat. Um, I got her through a rescue because she was not taken care of properly. And she is wild and she's happy in my home. I have tall, 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 tall <laughs> trees for her in the house and um, she has a lot of enrichment, but she's happy. But if she was outside because she's so exotic looking and beautiful, she would be stolen in a second. Um, not to say other cats wouldn't be stolen, but um, it, it just, it, it would be a very unfortunate situation. They often go missing or lost and people are heartbroken after, you know, not being able to find their cats. And then often death can be a result of this. So Regardless of the fact that they are killing our wildlife, which is a huge, huge concern, there are many obvious other concerns that we need to be concerned about with our cats when they go outside. These are gruesome and I know it, and I apologize, but these photos are reality of what we see. The picture on the left is a dove that um, was bit 
um, right at the, the air, uh, crop and her muscles and she was an unfortunate euthanasia. Some of, some of those um, severe cases can be treated and some of them unfortunately can't. This grackle uh, to the right is a small little fledgling. He's actually still with us. Um, he had a very bad bruise and air sac rupture, but with the help of antibiotics and pain meds that went down. So we were able to save him and you know he's continuing treatment with us right now. So cats should stay indoors. That's our basic fact. We know this. We know that it starts with us. We can't really do too much on the feral cats at this time. Um, TNR is a whole nother topic that we won't even get into, but personally, I believe that the cats are safer indoors. Um, my heart really sank a lot when I worked at the shelter, having to release these cats back outside to fend for themselves. They've um, become invasive and um, they are really wiping out our native species. So here it says, that if these cats were actually killing humans, 41% of our population would be gone. So think of that in perspective when it comes to what is being killed outside um, and how we can protect our cats, how we can keep them inside, how we can work with organizations better, how we can um, help and make more rescue situations. There's just, there's a lot that needs to be done, but it starts with us, the ones that own the domestics and, um, and then we lead by example. So catios and leashes are the best things for them. Um, if you don't want to get your cat interested in even with the outside, then I wouldn't recommend that. Um, they don't really go outside because of this, but they, you know, unless you take them on the leash, but they might get more interested in outside. I provide just lots of daily enrichment with my cats. We have playtime, we have lots of toys in the house. So cats can be comfortable in the house without having to go outside. Our next topic is uh, just as controversial as cats and as collisions, but let's talk trash. We know how bad the trash situation is. And when you don't recycle and help the planet by reducing this, it hurts our wildlife, it hurts our environment, and it's gonna eventually hurt our environment even more than it has right now. And who knows what's gonna happen to it long-term. We're seeing the effects right now. We're seeing the effects of climate change. We're seeing the effects of the weather situation. We're seeing our animals um, suffer. We're seeing our ocean ways um, destroyed by, by our water. Our sea turtles are highly, highly affected. When I was in Texas this year at a conference, I got to go to an, uh, an aquarium and see some sea turtles and hear about a lot of the issues that they've encountered. Um, and one of them actually lost its wing, or its wing, its flipper, <laughs> um, because of plastic um, basically cutting off circulation. So we need to do better with our environment. And this affects our birds also. Um, we have seen more issues this season than I can remember. I have been with the Bird Center nine years now and I don't recall seeing this many issues. We have seen birds coming in with string and wires wrapped all around their legs. Um, the pictures on the right are from a pigeon that came in with severe, severe inflammation and infection from the wire wrapped around. He actually was with us for about a month and a half. He had daily baths on his leg um, for treatment. He was actually just released last week, which was really awesome. Um, but some cases, unfortunately, are not that easy to treat. Um, the one on the left is was of, of Robin. Um, its leg was caught up all in string and um, it died on intake within a half an hour, probably due to stress. Um, it can cause a lot of damage in other ways. Even though the leg was just low dislocated, uh, there were no other internal injuries, but stress can cause a factor in death. This finch nest on the left um, came into us after it was brought in in a fern plant that was bought at a nursery just so happened that we found the nest in there with the babies and we looked at the nest further and saw that it was wrapped up with twine and ribbon. Um, so that is an example of how birds are making their nests. And the picture on the right is from um, Dominic, who's our intern and a photographer. We went out and released some birds last week and we noticed this osprey nest that was filled with plastic in it. So birds are making their nests with plastic. Their babies can ingest this or get twisted in this. So um, if they're making their nests from this, imagine all the other animals that are also doing this and then how it's affecting our humans. So it's a huge issue um, along with um, other products that are being used in the environment. 
So sticky traps are used for bird, or not used for birds, but used for um, possibly, you know, mice, ants, things like that. And they're just very, very inhumane. Um, this barn swallow was stuck on a sticky trap. And from the looks of it, it looks as if somebody cut its feathers and then just released it. And thankfully our rescuers found it and brought it to us because this bird um, would not be able to fly or, or thrive. And it was severely emaciated because it couldn't get food. And so we, um, thanks to the support of our followers, got some money raised to take it in for x-rays and everything looks fantastic. As I mentioned before, the swallow's co uh, collarbone and wing has to be 100%. And so the x-rays show that it looks good. So we are going to proceed treatment on this bird by pulling the feathers um, in, in short stages so it can properly um, be uh, re restart its molt basically and then be released by fall migration. So that's the plan with this guy. As far as the one um, on the opposite side, unfortunately, not a good outcome there. This caulk was used um, basically to um, seal up some areas in the cement on the driveway and it stays wet for 24 hours. So any animal that passes over that driveway is going to be caught in this caulk. And um, this unfortunately was not a good outcome for this bird. It was so caked in the caulk um, and that its feet were broken that we humanely euthanized. So before you use any kind of products, please make sure how it's going to affect the wildlife and, other, and others in the surrounding areas um, and long-term effects of that. Now on to the cuteness. So it's not just injuries that we see at the bird center, right? So we do see a lot of them, but we also get in tons of babies. Sometimes they're orphaned after people have monitored for hours and hours and not see a parent come back. But that's mostly unfortunately because it was probably cat caught or injured by a collision or some other predator got to it. We can't say for sure, but we know something happened to that, that parent. So that's why we step in. We take care of these orphan birds. Um, a lot of them also come in, as I mentioned, from tree cutting or the parents then are gone and they need our assistance. So that's the other reason we are here at the bird center is to take in the baby birds that need our help. So they, they are definitely the joy and the sweetness in our job. Um, they all make tons of requests, whether it's the chimney swifts that have to be eat, uh, eat every 10 minutes. Um, or the swallows that need to be flying around the center nonstop in order to get their practice. So once all these birds are ready, we eventually send them to a pre-flight aviary um, where they get practice and enrichment and they start learning the outside more and then they get released after spending time in there. And these are great examples of bird mouths. So we can actually identify baby birds by the color of the inside of their mouth, their eye shape and the feathers on their head. Um, so some people might not be able to tell the difference between some of these beaks. Um, and some of you might be able to see some of the similarities, but this is a definite wonderful way to be able to identify baby birds. Um, it takes a lot of practice and um, it can be difficult. A lot of birds look different in a photo that we get sent than they do in person. Um, but if we get a general idea, we can kind of be able to figure out what kind of bird is coming to us before it comes to us. Um, chickadees we have and white-breasted nuthatch. The nuthatch is obviously a little bit older, but you can tell um, ident you know, identification-wise what it is. As a baby though, they are pretty easy to be able to tell and spot. These are a little bit older fledglings that um, have come to the center that um, you know, are basically then pre-released. And so we wanna thank you for today for learning all about birds with us. I know I kind of skimmed through that kind of fast, but I wanted to make sure I got in our main points today and what we're doing at the Bird Center. We are almost close to capacity, which is really, really hard on us right now. We're trying to get out a lot of birds over the next few days. Um, some adults that came in that were collision injuries that are now ready to be released. Um, because more and more babies are coming in as migration patterns are starting to slow down. We're not seeing as many collisions as we were a few weeks ago, um, but babies are coming in full strong. Um, so um, our lines are often busy. If you call us and need assistance, please call back if our line is busy. We are there throughout the entire day to answer phone calls um, and we accept birds from 7.30 a.m. until 8 o'clock at night. 
and information here on for windows, how to help your windows, how to prevent windows, and more information here. You can reach out um, to Heidi um, at Just Save Ver or um, Heidi at, I'm sorry, I was like Safe <laughs> Washington Safe Passage, and also on Patreon here for Just Save Birds. Um, and she's also um, helps out with uh, Detroit Audubon at times as well. And for more information on the Bird Center, this is all of our information. We have lots of platforms here. Our website has great information. Our Facebook page is updated daily with videos and pictures as long as along with Instagram. Um, we have Patreon, which is a monthly fundraising platform for us. We have YouTube, we have different merch, which I'm actually wearing a Bird Center t-shirt right now. So we have different um, t-shirts you can buy. And then ways of donating to us is through PayPal, on our website or through our Amazon wish list, um, which we have quite a few items on there that we still need for the season. My information is on here as well as our general contact information. And if you're interested in volunteering, we are having volu new volunteers start as of June 1st. Um, so we're welcoming back volunteers in small amounts. Um, we do not know the plan for the rest of the month for June as far as this pandemic. But we are accepting volunteers. We have masks for everyone. We're prop practicing proper protocols and cleaning. Um, and so we're just trying to stay with that. So staff and volunteers are the only ones allowed in the building at this time. And we're kind of spacing out the staff and volunteers, but we still need you a lot. <laughs> um, we need help with cleaning, feeding, and just keeping up with the amount of birds that we have. Like I said, we're almost at capacity. That usually doesn't occur until the middle of the summer. Um, at times, so um, we could use your help with the amount of birds we're taking in. So um, we are gonna be opening up now to some questions. And I just wanna say thank you all for supporting the Bird Center, learning about the Bird Center and supporting our mission. Yay, thank you, Andrea. You're welcome. Um, so for our questions, um, the first question that we have is, is the presentation available somewhere? We are recording this, um, so we will be able to send it out to everybody who is currently watching and everybody who signed up for the Eventbrite. Um, so that will go to everybody. And then Andrea, would you be okay if we, if we share these slides with people? Okay. Absolutely. We'll, great. We can, so we'll share the whole, um, the PowerPoint presentation as well. Um, so if there's a specific um, part that you want to share with people, you're able to do that. Okay, mm -hmm. next question we have. Um, does Detroit and or Ann Arbor have lights out during migration campaign? Um, Detroit Audubon does, um, but it is tricky with, we don't have any specific funding for it. So we're not able to put too much time towards it. Um, and then Andrea, do you want to touch on the, the Washtenaw Safe Passage? Yeah, I, um, you know, I know that the Washtenaw Audubon was doing something before, um, but I don't think as of right now, Ann Arbor has anything in place. Um, so that would be, again, something that needs to be done either with um, the help of the Safe Passage groups and the Audubons. Um, all the main cities are gonna need some help. So, you know, and, um, the number, the top obvious cities that are getting collisions are Ann Arbor, Detroit, um, Grand Rapids is also a big one. So we wanna make sure we're having lights out in those areas. Um, who do we contact or how do we find a licensed rehabber? So there is, oh, I should have included it on this PowerPoint, I didn't even think. <laughs> um, so, if you go onto the Michigan DNR site, there is a list, or even if you type in Google, you can type in like license Michigan rehabbers or DNR license rehabbers, however you wanna word it, it'll come up. There's a whole list of licensed rehabbers. There are some licensed rehabbers that are not on the list because they um, don't wanna give out their personal information. However, um, anybody that's on that list can be contacted. It goes off of every county and by what they see and what they treat. Um, so it's a really good list. It's important that you, when you use that list, that you're getting it fresh every time because if you save a copy of it, um, some of it might be changed. So that DNR list is updated a lot and so uh, it changes a lot too. So you wanna make sure you have the newest copy on hand for the proper rehabbers that are working right now. 
Great. Um, what program exists to dim lights in homes or buildings? Um, and I think that is asking about the safe passage. And then in right. some cities, it's also referred to as um, lights out or dark skies. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple different program names. Um, our next question. Oh, what is the number for the Bird Center? I put that in the chat. It's right there, our phone number. <laughs> and it's there. Yeah, um, there's our phone number. Uh, does so the Bird Center cover Wayne County? We do. We cover any county. So the thing with birds is, um, well, with mammals, there's certain restrictions. Certain mammals cannot go out of the county. Certain raccoons, um, deer, due to different viruses and things that they carry. With birds, it's a little bit different. Um, we did have an issue before when the avian flu was a very bad thing going around with waterfowl, and they had to be restricted by counties. But with birds, um, we can accept any county. So we accept birds pretty much from Washina, Wayne, Macomb, Oakland, Jackson, um, Kent County, no, not Kent County is too far, um, um, <laughs> Eaton Rapids, Livingston. Some people have driven us birds all the way from like Flint or St. Clair County. It, it really depends on if you're willing to drive. We um, are one of the only few songbird facilities around. Uh, there is um, Wild Wings in Oakland County, um, which is in Hazel Park. Uh, she does babies. Uh, at this time though, right now, she's temporarily full. There is the Howell Nature Center that does songbirds, um, but a lot of the times they refer them to us if they're getting overwhelmed or full for the season, which currently they are. Um, and then there's a woman named Judy that's in Pontiac. She takes baby birds. And that's about it, unfortunately. <laughs> So oh, um, there's not many songbirds out there. There are a few people that are sub-permitted through other people um, that can help and assist, but as far as general centers, there's only a few. Um, do you have any suggestions on what to use or what product to use for the um, hummingbird food or hummingbird nectar? So sugar and water, that's your best, uh, best, that's it. You don't need to use any artificial dyes. So, um, you know, you just have to make um, a one in four duration. Um, I use a big jug, like I have a big glass jug and I make it up like every week and I keep it in my fridge. Um, so that's kind of like my weekly, my weekly thing um, is making up hummingbird nectar. Um, so if you just use sugar and water, that's all they need. Um, provide some native plants outside. That's an excellent option also. Um, I wish I could take my computer over with me outside right now and I would show you guys, but I have just a simple setup of a hummingbird feeder with a big giant native plant hanging next to it. Um, and then I also have an Oriole feeder. Um, I feed them their oranges. I don't use grape jelly as much and I will only say this, this is just my opinion, but um, a lot of people unfortunately don't know the certain types of grape jelly and they just assume that they like grape jelly and they'll buy whatever. Um, there's a lot of grape jelly such as like the Smucker's brand and stuff that are like very, very high in sugar um, concentrations. So we want to make sure that we're not using those ones that we want to use something more organically based. Um, but also we found a lot where um, a lot of these birds will come in very, very sticky to jelly and their wings will not be able to open because they might be um, sitting too much into the jelly feeders. Um, and jelly is not really a huge food that you would find in the environment. So I like to stick with just oranges. It's a little bit safer for the birds, um, but just a tip from what I've examined. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's generally what I, what I think too. The oranges are just safer. Yeah, um, they're more natural in the environment. Are there any specific disease risks with bird feeders that are accessible to squirrels? And is there a way to repel the squirrels? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything that birds can get to squirrels and vice versa. Squirrels can carry mange a lot, but I don't think it's the same kind of mange that's transferred to birds and birds don't usually get that kind. So I don't think there is. Um, but you always want to just make sure you're cleaning your feeders just in general to keep away any kind of infectious diseases. Um, it's also important to rake under your feeders for bird droppings. Uh, people sometimes forget about that. 
As far as keeping away squirrels, oh, those pesky squirrels, right? So I usually suggest getting a separate feeder for them. Most people don't want to do that, but it will sometimes <laughs> turn them away from going after their own food, uh, after the bird food. The other thing is Wild Birds Unlimited sells a lot of wonderful different types of um, feeders that have um, squirrel deterrents on there where they can't actually slide up the things. Do not use oils or any of those deterrents that you find online. Those are unsafe and, and, and can be very harmful. So um, reach out to some of your local um, stores to see about getting something, but there are different kinds of feeders that you can use that will keep the squirrels off of them and let the birds, you know, enjoy their food. Great. Um, how do we safely handle a bird? Um, specifically, is there any danger to humans from a di for disease from the bird? So, obviously it's best when you touch anything outside to wear gloves. That's just what mom and dad taught us, right? So if you have gloves, use gloves. If you don't, just wash your hands after. There's nothing that's very contagious on a bird that could get to you. The only thing that could happen is if it had a parasite in its stool and it landed on your hand and then you licked your hand or something and it got in your mouth. Um, or if you just didn't wash your hands properly and there was still feces on there and somehow it got ingested. So that's the only way you're gonna get something. Um, from a bird. If you found an injured bird, the best way to help it is by taking a hand towel, washcloth, gently place it over the bird. Um, if a bird has an injured wing and it's like running or whatever, it can be a little bit stressful to try and chase the bird. So we do suggest, you know, um, if you have a net, most people have like a fishing net sometimes, um, <laughs> like a cheap butterfly net from the dollar store, that's an option. Um, but if you don't have that, Oh, you can use even a large towel and just kind of toss it over the bird. Um, you want to just kind of temporarily blind them, grab them, and be able to safely put them in an enclosure, place them in a box, no food or water, unless we instruct you to do that. Um, what you give them could definitely jeopardize uh, their well-being. If the water is in, incorrect, it can cause aspiration. If food is given incorrectly, it can cause lots of issues. So. Um, it's best to just keep them in a box until you talk to somebody and we can then proceed from there. Um, I will say collision injuries are different from baby injuries because babies require heat and sometimes food where collision injuries, um, heat can actually cause brain swelling and they actually don't need to eat right away. So depending on the circumstance of the bird that you rescued might require different things. So that's why it's always important to talk to a rehabber. Um, next question is, how do you teach these baby birds to be adults in terms of catching food, nesting, and migration? So this is the most incredible thing. So it's an instinct in them. And we have a video that we posted on our Facebook just about within the past five days. So if you search for it, it's on there. Um, so we had a baby grackle in the center and we also had an adult grackle. The adult grackle came in for a wing injury and um, we treated it over a two month period, had physical therapy, all these things. It was getting ready to be released. And this baby grackle started squawking and we heard this gra adult grackle freaking out basically. And we're like, what's happening? Over the period of time of a week, this mother grackle figured out that there was a grackle in the center that needed assistance and it would do anything it could to get to that baby. So we introduced them and it started feeding this baby bird. So it is a natural instinct for birds to feed, take care of their babies. It's also a natural instinct for swallows to just come out of the nest and know how to catch food and fly. It's just something that they learn how to do. So this is why it's so important for fledglings to be on the ground. Their mother and father are near them. They're trying to stay away from them far enough but also far enough to also still watch them. So those birds are starting to learn how to pick at the ground, starting to learn how to eat. They're gonna spread their wings and start flapping and eventually be able to take off. And mom and dad are looking over to watch. So we do that the same way at the bird center by feeding them all natural diets, proper insects, live food, everything that they would get in the wild. We rarely use any kind of formulas unless it's specific for that bird. We want them to have natural enrichment, which we provide them with you know, leaves and ivy and different things like that in their enclosures so they know what that material is like. 
And then they go into these pre-release cages, which are flight cages, for anywhere from seven to 10 days. They will experience sounds of predators around them. They'll experience rain and sunshine. They're gonna learn how to scavenge for their own food. And we make sure that they do this successfully while they're out there for a week. And that's when we know that they can be released. If we see problems where they're not doing this and they're not flying in this, and we'll take them back and we'll see what we can do to help them. But most of them have that instinct to be able to self-feed on their own eventually and be able to fly and they just don't need us. They actually don't need us at all. We have interrupted their life. And so it's, it's you know, we are just assisting them with feeding them and they, they're able to just do it on their own. I hope that answers you, your question. Yes, that was great. Um, do you have any advice for someone who's looking to become a wildlife rehabber specifically with birds? Volunteering is your first step, big time. Um, so in order to become a licensed rehabber, it's not super hard, um, but there is a few steps. So you do have to take a class called the Basic Introduction to Wildlife. It's a two-day class that has a lab, lecture and a lab. It goes over your basic information on how to rehab, um, how to examine, what to look for, things like that. Um, it's usually held once or twice a year. Um, I, I have helped last year with Wildside and Eaton Rapids do it. This year, I do believe the Howell Nature Center is planning to host the class in November. Um, so we will keep everybody updated on that. We always post the information on our uh, Facebook page and website. Um, you can find out this information through the wrc.org. It's the International Wildlife Rehabilitation Council. They post information on these classes. Um, so sometimes if you're out of state, they have them there also. So you take this class, you get a certification. Does it make you a rehabber? Doesn't do anything, but this is your um, requirement if you wanna become a licensed rehabber. If you wanna work with birds, especially federally protected birds, you're gonna need some volunteer time. So I always recommend volunteering or applying for an internship. So we offer internships every season. Um, they run um, usually from end of April, um, until the end of the summer, and then we also need help in the fall. Um, so by doing an internship or volunteering, that's your first step. You also um, can just start educating yourself by taking classes online. But once you get a certain amount of hours, you um, can apply for a permit. Um, there's more details and stuff like that involved that I don't wanna go into all here, but basically you need to get some volunteer time in, you need to take a class, um, and then you just need to also get like a letter of recommendation from a licensed rehabilitator or licensed veterinarian. I will say it's not easy to just become a wildlife rehabber. I was very lucky with my position that it was already an established position at a facility. Most people that are rehabbers want to do it themselves um, and it's all out of pocket. We do not get paid by the DNR, by the state, by anything. You have to establish grants on your own if you want to get any grant funding, but otherwise it's by donations from the public. We are doing a public service for these animals with the help of, of you. Of you. Um, and so some people are lucky to have money put aside or have you know a partner that helps, um, or they might have a second job, but that's the reality of it. It's a very expensive, expensive thing. Um, it costs anywhere from 70 to $80 per bird for treatment and uh, roughly probably about $100,000 a season to take care of all these animals with the pricing of medication, supplies, food, and all the things that you need. So it's not cheap and it's not just something you can just, you know, I'm just gonna become a rehabber. You have to also have proper housing and requirements for the DNR, US Fish and Wildlife for your enclosures. So um, if you definitely do have sincere information, feel free to always email me and uh, we could talk more about that. But volunteering is always the best start. Simple answer. <laughs> great. Um, okay, so we have the last question, which is great because I know that you have to get to work. Um, do you have any tips for keeping house sparrows out of bluebird nesting boxes? Ooh, the invasive topic. Uh, that's a tough one. Um, I know that the Bluebird Society has a whole bunch of tips and information. 
Um, I know that some people have tried the wires in front of the bluebird nesting boxes. I've heard that sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, it's hard. It's a hard one because, you know, um, they kill our, 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 navity, our cavity, cavity nesting birds. They, we see a lot of destruction from them. Um, I don't have a simple answer and I'm sorry that you kind of stumped me on that. Mm -hmm. We try to say by promoting um, less feeding for them, which um, they absolutely, um, there's certain foods that they don't like. So um, if you try to feed different foods, um, some hot, hot pepper type foods from Wild Birds Unlimited they have, um, and different, um, I'm trying to think of, I think, I can't think of the one food that they really hate. Do you know, Ava? The food that the sparrows don't like? There's one food that they like can't stand and it deters them. And I cannot oh. believe it. But there's something that it's a seed of some sort. They just don't like it. And it's kind it's of it's safflower. Maybe. Yeah. I, I think wonder. they might be it because I think it's, um, it's got like a bitter taste to it and I don't think they like it. Um, so if you feed more of that and more nut and dried berries, um, mm -hmm. we feed a lot of our uh, native birds, like our big woodpeckers, um, titmouse, chickadees, um, different things like that, that will promote more natives to your yard and less of the sparrows um, because sparrows are not huge nut eaters. Uh, they're not big peanut eaters. So that might be a suggestion to help. My yard is unfortunately taken over by house sparrows because I live in the middle of the city. So I have no positive story on that. Um, so it's a tough one, um, but just trying to remove their nests. That's also a big thing. If you see them building a nest, you are legally able to remove a invasive species nest, which is a house sparrow or a starling. You want to also make sure though, that it is a house sparrow because there's many different species of sparrow. So make sure you know what sparrow it is before, because other than house sparrows, we have a lot of native sparrows that do nest in our area. So other than that, taking out their nest and feeding them food they don't like would be my best suggestion. Yeah, good question. Yeah. There's, there really is no, no perfect solution for that yet. Mm -hmm. um, but the, um, like you mentioned, the Bluebird Society, their website has a lot of information about different tactics that people use and that you can try finding for yourself. Um, so great. Thank you guys for coming out and um, listening you, and learning with us. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Andrea, for taking the time to educate all of us. We really, really appreciate it so much. Um, and yeah, all of the information is listed here. We'll be sending all of this out. Um, and please do remember that um, the Bird Center of Washtenaw County is run by donations and depends on donations. So um, if you're able to visit their page and donate a little bit, that keeps them running and um, they can't do it without those donations. So we would both really appreciate Yeah, today, that. today is what we call $5 Friday. Um, $5, if you have $5 to spare, you wouldn't believe how much $5 adds up. If we could get 2,000 of our followers following Facebook to just give us all $5, <laughs> that would be incredible. Even a dollar helps. So honestly, it really does add up. No amount is too small um, for us to be taking care of these birds. So we truly appreciate anything, even just spreading awareness, letting people know that we exist that we are here helping the birds from sunrise to sunset um, every single day. We don't take off holidays. We are there round the clock. So um, we really appreciate your support and, and it was great uh, presenting information to you guys today. Great, thank you. Bye everyone. Bye.